ElectroCast. Hold music. You want to avoid it, and so do your customers. So say goodbye to hold music and hello to faster, smarter support with Salesforce. Make service more personal and agents more productive using built-in trusted AI. Then watch costs and wait times drop and satisfaction soar. Support customers in a whole new way with Service GPT. Learn how at salesforce.com slash service GPT. Welcome to Nature Back Podcast, where we are talking with our guests about the green future. My name is Tarmo Verki, and today my guest is Professor Adam Bermont, an investor from North England and also a trustee and a non-executive director at the Eden Project. Enjoy the show. Welcome, Adam, to Nature Backed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are recording this interview on the sidelines of uh, Startup Day in Tartu. It's uh, mid-March. This becomes relevant in the, the world we are living today. As an investor, you're looking at the news flow around us. Where are we? Are we? Is it, is it is it the end of the world around us? Or, mm. um, I, I think that uh, the the language around investment and and the the impact that we're trying to have about investment and what we're investing for um, are often a little, it's often a little confusing. I have a dear friend called Bill McDonough, uh, who uh, is seen as the grandfather of the sort of circular economy. And, and he puts this really quite simple. Um, sometimes people confuse doing something uh, that's impactful, um, which is not doing more good, but it's actually just allowing people to be less bad. So when we're talking about the technology that's behind our aspirations, we have to get our aspirations right first. So when we talk about we want to be net zero, well, all that we're doing is we're focusing on, on technologies about reduction and we're becoming less bad and less bad and less bad and less bad until we're just not bad. And the, the word we have for that is sustainable. And sustainable is often seen as this positive thing. But uh, if you were to describe the relationship you had with your husband or wife as sustainable, it doesn't really sound so good. No. <laughs> um, so, so the other side of this is, is looking at technologies which embrace a circular economy, uh, put what is one output uh, back as the input into, into another technology, so removing waste from the equation. And these two things can be done at the same time. So the simple side is, is the reduction and, and the less bad. But we really need to be supporting those innovators that have really grasped that they need to do things differently and they need to move the dial on technologies which are more good. So, like for example, one of the things I'm really excited about at the moment that I'm an investor in uh, through a little fund that I operate called LS7 uh, is an artificial diamond company. Now, obviously, people get excited about diamonds, and there's, there's the obvious um, uh, use for them as an aesthetic uh, uh, ornament. But what, why I invested uh, was I wanted to see what impact this could have on the cost of doing deep drilling, and particularly deep drilling for geothermal energy, which is stable baseload energy. So, so this company is now making four to six carat uh, diamonds for, for drilling heads. And this is going to decimate the cost of deep geothermal stable baseload power. So that's the kind of thing I'm excited about, which is really a step change in... <coughs> excuse me. No worries. That's the kind of thing I'm really excited about because it's, mm. it's enabling a step change in the renewable market. Um, we've always talked about how we uh, can approach becoming uh, fossil fuel independent or remove fossil fuels uh, with a nuclear renewables mix. Uh, deep geothermal is, is one of the first opportunities to provide 24-7 stable baseload that could actually reduce the need for that nuclear intervention. Not necessarily remove it, but certainly reduce it. So I'm always looking at what is the technology behind the technology that gets us to the impact that we want. So you're not worried about you know, ECB deciding rates going there or there or that uh, bank run on the bank on Silicon Valley Bank or these things don't really have a on a big picture, the impact might be relatively limited. 
I, I think um, in, in terms of impact, uh, the cost of energy is probably something that we didn't really see coming. Um, and many people, though, have called it a black swan event. But if you if you look at it uh, properly, <laughs> uh, mm. we've we've been living off cheap carbon based energy for a long time. Uh, and that's something that we should have been doing something about a long, long time ago. I remember when I was I remember this um, uh, really vividly. Uh, I used to read a lot as a kid and when I was uh, 12, I, I read a book, um, this was 1984, uh, by John Elkington. And it was a fact-based, science-driven narrative on where we need to be in terms of renewables, uh, where our baseload demand is likely to be, uh, the behavioral change we need to, to enact to stop our baseload demand from spiraling out of control. Uh, and and the, the need for nuclear. And when you look at his book, uh, which is as, as relevant today as it was back in 1984, uh, we're only about a quarter of the way on the journey that we're expected to be on by this time. We were meant to have engin engineered ourselves around this, this challenge, and we failed. Mm -hmm. So we're kidding ourselves if we think that the, the cost of energy was suddenly a surprise. So, so having the East sort of pull the rug out from underneath us um, was probably a good wake-up call for us to actually start to do the right thing. Yeah. And the right thing would be what? Uh, the right thing uh, is, is to really question our priorities and, and, and consumption and, and how we behave and how we how we drive energy usage in the supply chain. And we all, we all try to do the right thing. Mm. Um, there is always more that we can do. Uh, but in, ter in terms of our food miles, uh, you know, our, our choices as to what we eat, uh, and, and again, uh, there was, there was a, a quite a humorous piece uh, with uh, quote, quoting our um, Secretary of State for, for our Department of Agriculture. Um, saying that we should all eat turnips in the winter. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot of sense in that. Um, there's a lot of sense in actually us getting ourselves back into sync and into rhythm with the planet and the locale that we we live in. There's there's a reason why it's better for you to eat honey from from local farms. Uh, it's better for your immune system. Uh, if we can be more in sync with with consuming food from our locale, um, we'll be better for it. Mm. Absolutely. The uh, kind of working on the energy crisis of Europe, uh, I think short term, a lot of it has been solved by LNG from the US or the, or the Arab countries or, from, or whatever weird places. But, and a lot of talk is that we need to, I don't know, renovate the whole energy system of Europe and, and at the same time, like, you know, nuclear power plants. I mean, Finland this week started its nuclear power plant, which was supposed to come on stream in 2009. So, I mean, they built it probably 10 years or 15 years before that, and now it was 15 years late to actually start. It's it's not like any quick fix solution building anything nuclear, but uh, is there any other fixes beyond that? Again, I think, I think geothermal you talked about a little bit, but that's probably also not something which is solving the next winter challenge. Or it it can um, it can be that that quick. Um, again, one one of this, there's two parts to the the, the energy challenge. Uh, there's the the energy creation, and there's the energy distribution. Most countries, and particularly as you move further and further east, have got very much legacy uh, energy distribution networks. So the, the ability to create power in one place and transport it and consume it in another is, is limited by the capacity of the network and the transmission losses from one place to another. So there's two ways around that. One is to bolster a national transmission network. The other is to focus more on hyper-local 
uh, uh, generation and the storage. So there's a singularity here in terms of uh, where we're getting to in terms of storage technology. Uh, if we can get to sort of non non uh, alkaline earth metal uh, type storage batteries, which we're starting to see some really promising papers now, um, we can we can do mass storage and also hybrid storage, where we use uh, again non metal ba batteries for uh, the the slow discharge and the storage of, of the large bulk of the energies, uh, and then use um, uh, metal polymer batteries for the more rapid discharge, or maybe even carbon ultra capacitors. Um, so uh, graphene has been uh, mm -hmm. ultra capacitors is, is something that looks very promising as well. So you can have this hybrid storage model, and that takes you to um, local local geothermal geothermal not really for ge driving turbines though, but but for for managing that that base load heat requirement that we all need, uh, and that takes away the bulk of our of our power demands. Uh, and then you're looking at local generation and storage for for everything else that that needs electricity. And then you're not stressing the national networks. And you're also building an awful lot of resilience as well into the system because exactly. you can then use the what was left of the national networks to do en energy balancing and storage balancing in a regional manner without having to do any long-haul transmission at all. Uh, and again, that's small-scale nuclear as well. Um, and we've started to get something that looks a little bit more sensible. And small-scale nuclear also has an awful lot of um, security benefits because... Uh, there isn't that much nuclear yield, uh, and it's in a much smaller form factor, and mm. it's also a, a less exploitable nuclear yield that it has. So, so all of these technologies are sort of approaching a single singularity to to start to point us towards local storage, local generation. Uh, I don't know how in general, but at least locally here, the situation is very much like you were describing that. Uh, the distribution networks are old and not very flexible to do anything. I wanted to put up a small uh, solar park on the backyard, and uh, the grid company asked, uh, was it, I think it was 925,000 euros plus taxes for connecting it to the network. And it was like, you know, probably, <laughs> I don't know, hundreds of years of energy consumption for me personally. So... But at the same time, I think probably many places, you know, local grids are not really legal or is there a legal room to build local grids to, you know, for the, for the, I don't know, villages or the, or the islands. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, my hope is on an island. So. So this, this is, this is an interesting area. I was smiling as you were, you were, um, getting there. asking the question. Uh, so uh, the uh, the manor house that I own actually also owns um, a local substation, uh, which isn't adopted by the uh, by the municipality, and we have a, a number of villages that we actually bill for electricity. Uh, as a as an infrastructure owner, I, I own data centres. I'm quite mm. comfortable with with owning um, electricity substations. And, and I'm also very comfortable with, with, with building the end customers. And we are going to do a, 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 a solar farm. And mm. it only makes sense if you can store the electricity and then give it at a preferential rate to, to, the, to the, the local tenants and landowners. Um, because again, as you say, uh, the, the, the grid wants millions uh, to, mm. to actually fortify the grid to accept the electricity. Uh, so we, exactly. have to, we have to think hyper-local. Mm. And... And I'm looking forward to doing that scheme because I think it will also create a bit of a sense of community as well. Um, I, I, when I installed my first solar array, I became a bit of a solar bore. And on a day like today, when it's it's you know it's beautiful and cold but beautifully sunny, uh, I'd be showing everybody my app and showing how off grid I was. Uh, and and that's something that can bring people together as well. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, so hyper local energy production. Uh, I mean. Is it you're doing it as part of your community, but is it something which is you know replicable, or is it, is it a wider drive which could be you know could be pushed that I don't know the Europe or that or the world towards more hyper local energy production? I think it's starting to happen. Uh, each country has its own schemes, uh, and as as you move further north, um, there's kind of an inflection point in in um, the. Uh, the efficiency of, of, of or the well the return on on, on solar um, just just due to the, the luminous density of the of the sun, um, 
but you can mix that with with other renewables as well. Um, the, of course. So there's 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 tidal. There's there's not that not that much opportunity for hydro in Estonia. And not <laughs> not so much in hydro in Estonia, but you know, looking at north, uh, I mean, Scandinavia is living on hydro, the where they kind of need, especially in the northern part, is. Uh, there is no sun, <laughs> basically. Uh, basically, yeah. yeah. For uh, at least uh, in some parts, uh, half a year, there is no sun or something like that. Yeah, four, sure. four months of the darkness. Yeah, sure, but I, I do, I do feel though that it, it, it's definitely a mission to, um, to, to start to, to remove shale oil from the mix in Estonia. I th- I Tell think me about it. I mean, uh, I've been thinking about maybe I need an electric car just to you know, be greener, but at the same time, electric car in Estonia is, you know, worse for the environment than my gas car. It, this, this is, again, this is, a, this is a life cycle and sort of circular economy kind yeah. of um, uh, piece. There's probably been a little bit greenwashed by, by marketing, but also by well-meaning, well-meaning governments. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in the UK, for example, uh, we have huge subsidies uh, for electric cars. Mm. If you're a business owner, the, the, the cars are basically free. Uh, plus, um, you don't have to pay any congestion zones or emission zone charges. Mm. Uh, and that can only last for so long. But what that's done is, is it's, it's incentivized people to get an electric car as, as, a, as an early adopter. And this has driven consumption, i.e. the purchase of the electric car, maybe three or four years before they would have replaced the car anyway. Yeah. So it's not just the the batteries and and the upholstery and the metals, uh, it's it's actually there was a perfectly good car uh, that's that's now basically onto its next life prematurely, mm. and also probably uh, won't be used as meaningfully. Mm. So so we've dri- we've driven this consumption, and at some point quite soon we're going to tax it again. Uh, I mean I have a Tesla, and I don't. I don't consider it necessarily a green thing. I, I'm lucky enough to have my own solar array, so I'm, I'm charging mostly off grid. Yeah. Um, but let's not pretend, um, you know, that a Tesla is a, it's not it's a supercar. Uh, so the amount of consumption of energy is relatively huge. They have they have the acceleration of a super of a supercar mm. uh, if you so use them like that. Um, so if you look at sort of the the whole kilowatts per mile. Uh, it's not the most economical thing, and we should really think about that. And we also have a Citroen, uh, not, sorry, not Citroen 500. Uh, we also have a Fiat 500, and and its energy consumption is is pretty much zero. Uh, and you, you fill it up, and it lasts for months. Um, and it's also probably got five or six years of useful life at least in it, probably more. Mm-hmm. So again, trying trying to think about the whole life cycle and the impact. When we get to that um, point where we are taxed on the cost of producing the car uh, in carbon cost, I think that's going to be really quite um, uh, Could be quite uh, illumin- illumin- illuminating. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. It's an interesting, interesting thought. The uh, the whole economy has been so much based on kind of free use of the nature or the or so our surroundings that uh, you know tax based on the carbon carbon use would be. Be quite an interesting addition to the car, car car price. I was thinking, what would happen to the car dealerships? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, uh, well, car dealerships are a, a, le- a less of less of a of a, of a concept these days. Mm. Um, I don't think I actually spoke to anybody when I picked up my Tesla. Uh, <laughs> it was a, it was a key on a desk. Mm. Um, I mean, this was COVID times, mm. um, but it was it was basically a letter and a key, and I took the key and got in the car. <laughs> And everything works. That's a, it's a beautiful future we are moving towards. The, um, yes, in Estonia we have a problem with oil shale. I think Estonia is uh, per person is probably the worst on the, on the carbon output or the kind of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but there's no other local energy sources. So when uh, the, the eastern border was closed, there is no no power going anywhere there. There are a few, few projects to build uh, nuclear power plants. There are a few, kind of the small scale nuclear plant project, as a, at least one is alive. There are a few big wind projects because the Baltic Sea is relatively 
relatively unused around mm. our islands. Uh, of course, as an islander, I'm thinking it will be on my beach. But, <laughs> uh, or at least visible from my beach, not, not, not on the beach still, but, but the, all this kind of the local, local challenges in a way to, to power the country. But the you know, oil shale is not something we should be using that's crazy. Yeah, I think, I think we could probably cope with a little bit of an aesthetic imbalance. Even uh, I could, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolu- absolutely. absolutely. Wind is a big opportunity because basically like Denmark, uh, we, are, we, we have so much of the shores where windmills could be put up and that would be a big part of the well, solution for the country. Well, there used to be many windmills. Yeah, uh, there, there still are. They're not used too many of them. I don't sure. think any of them actually u- used for anything but uh, maybe hospitality or something like that. Yeah. Uh, going forward, what are your, your biggest, uh, I don't know, challenges of 2023? I think, I think the biggest challenges are, are um, not, not just personal, but uh, I think relates to all of us who are trying to, uh, to, to breathe life into things, to create something from nothing. Um, it's, uh, it's something that we, as entrepreneurs, find rewarding. But I think it's hard on the soul. Uh, and I think that it's, it's, it's hard on those that are part of the teams that, that do this. And in, in Estonia, um, uh, you see um, you know, one startup creates a success, they exit, uh, and then the same great team reforms in a different, in a different manner, um, gets some more investment, uh, goes on another sprint, um, exits again, and they reinvest. It's a beautiful virtuous circle in Estonia because that wealth stays local, um, which is something we, we need to learn from. Uh, but this sprint, sprint, sprint is, is really hard. Awesome. Uh, there's a brilliant book by Pete Frame, which is called The Rock and Roll Family Tree, where you can actually see all the rock stars in the bands and how they've flowed down and how it eventually becomes Thin Lizzy or, or Deep Purple or... Pink Floyd or Led Zeppelin, and you can see these rock stars uh, through through their career, and you can see the same, uh, you know, in the sort of the startup tale in in Estonia. But what I, I I feel is that we have to find a way of you know of balancing this 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 unnatural sort of work sprint load, which is massively intense, with with you know how we operate ourselves. Um, you know, we're fighting against every natural rhythm that there is out there. Um, you know, we're caffeinating ourselves. We're sticking ourselves in front of a screen for 12 hours a day or more. Uh, you know, all of, all of this. We have to find a way to just listen to ourselves. Our nervous systems are generally running at 110%. And we don't give ourselves the quiet time to actually realize just how much we're, we're, we're racing and on overload. So I'm really wanting to focus on that, not just for me, but for my team, and, and also to hopefully create something for, for the wider tech community as well. Mm, something to, to balance the life. Yeah, they call it, they call it clock science. Okay. Uh, one of the leading authors is a, is a friend of mine called um, Professor Russell Foster. And he's written many papers on the efficacy of medicines, depending on when you take them. Um, and they can be almost useless at some times and very valuable at others. Um, but looking at how we function as humans and how badly we function and how we actually age. And we age not just um, cell deterioration, but thought processes, you know, cognitive power by us being out of sync with our planet. Uh, the, the Eden Project in Morecambe is going to be all about raising awareness of natural rhythms uh, and how we shouldn't ignore them and how we should start to embrace them mm. and how we could be better for ourselves and for the planet as part of that. So again, this is, this is part of the narrative that I'm really wanting to kind of pursue over the next year and years. Mm. For the audience, tell us in a few words, what is Eden Project? I visited the original like 20 plus years ago when it was yet to be opened. I think I was probably one of the first journalists on the ground, at least from abroad. But tell, tell what is Eden Project? So the, the Eden Project is a charity, uh, probably best known for its first project, uh, which was created in Cornwall. Uh, it was built in an old clay pit, 
where there was no soil, there was no life, it was spoilt land. Uh, we made our own soil. Uh, we built some structures, uh, which were uh, Buckminster fullerene type domes. Uh, and in those domes, those biomes, uh, we now have created a mechanism for, for supporting 3,600 species of, of plant life. The whole purpose of Eden uh, is, people call it an attraction, um, but fundamentally, uh, we take hard scientific fact and then we interpret it. And we interpret it and narrate it into something that we can storytell or exhibit, uh, interpret through dance, through interactive uh, sculptures, through, through performance. So we're bringing people through and we are softly and gently raising their awareness uh, of, of some of our planetary issues. So by the time they leave, and there's about 1.2 million people who go through this process every year, we've... we've mm. Mm. So we have about 1.2 million people a year going, th going through this process, this experience, and coming out the other side. Um, I joined Eden about 10 years ago. Um, my aspirations are to, to not make this process a serial process of bringing people through and storytelling, but also how we can add a digital platform, a digital experience to that, which can be global and can do that in parallel at the same time as also having Eden rooted in place. Um, we're actually the Eden Projects rather than Eden Project. Um, we have a project nearing completion in Qingdao in China, uh, which is about the importance of clean water. I should say the, the, the key message behind Cornwall is about the importance of plants and plants in the whole food and supply chain. Um, obviously, the importance of clean water uh, in Qingdao uh, is, is, as a great industrial city, is, is a, is a the, sort of the epicenter of where we should be delivering the message. And we've, we've allowed and China's allowed, uh, and there's no blame here, uh, that they would be uh, the, the place that, uh, that does all the dirty work for the rest of the world. Uh, so we wanted to work with them uh, and to, to create an awareness center. And again, supported by some great business leaders over there who, who want to affect change. And it is spectacular. Um, it's, it's the largest indoor waterfall in the world. So this place is going to be really quite a wonder. Uh, We've also just had uh, 50 million of leveling up fund money uh, to allow us to do a project in Morecambe. Again, Morecambe is in the north of the UK. It's in the northwest. It's a seaside town. Uh, it's, it's a forgotten coastal community. It used to be known as Bradford-upon-Sea because it was, it was the place where the rich mill owners from Bradford would get on the train the, with the suitcases, go to the coast and take in the, the, the bracing air of, 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 uh, of, the, of the northwest. Um, now it's high deprivation, very, very low employment. Um, you, can, you can see the faded opulence of what was you know, a thriving community, um, but there's, there's, a, there's an overall sense of sadness, sadness and hopelessness. And when we announced that we intended to create this Eden project, we got a standing ovation from, from the locals. Um, my team at the moment, they're, 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 um, they're running a, a series of engagements with the public because this is their Eden. We're just building it. It's theirs. And this is going to stimulate a whole load of economic growth, not just in Morecambe, but across the north. Um, for example, with Eden Cornwall, within two, two hours, there's only about one and a half million people. Within two hours of Morecambe, there's 10 and a half million people, not for, and that's not counting the 40 million people that commute up past Morecambe to the Lake District every year. So it's, it's a very, very exciting uh, project. And also, and also uh, the transport links are actually, um, are actually very, very strong. Even the old train services, which, which go from the major cities up north, um, they're not the fastest trains in the world, but it's, it's a beautiful part of God's own county and Lancashire that, that, that it goes through. Uh, 
the train services have even uh, embraced this and said that they want to create Eden branded, uh, Eden experience rail carriages. So you're actually starting the experience in Manchester or in Leeds or in York. Uh, and you're, then you, you can then turn the journey into an experience. We don't necessarily need to go faster. We just need better quality. So, so yes, it's, so, so Eden is, is, is really about regeneration. It's about a message of hope. It's about awareness. Um, and it's, it's based in science. So we, we put our arms around the best scientists uh, and we try to amplify their, their story in a way that it can be heard and understood. Uh, how long is the process from today until opening, when the audience can come and uh, you know experience it? So we've we've provisionally said 2026. Uh, all the conversations with government um, have been around us, not rushing the process, but doing it right. And what I mean by that is we could rapidly accelerate the build, but that would be at the expense of not finding. 100% local suppliers and we want to find local businesses that we can work with we can give them advance notice and we can work out how, how how to support them to scale if we were to give them a large construction project for example and with that in mind the hundred plus million that we're going to spend on this project will go straight back into the stakeholders mm -hmm. and, and, and the businesses in the region so it will have that double effect um, that's going to take a little bit longer all the conversations we've had with government have, the, the response to us has been, we'd rather you did it the right way, because mm. that becomes a true exemplar of levelling up. And then it's not just a, a case of one day there's a ribbon cutting and we've opened an Eden project. There's actually going to be a new story every other week when we place a, a new contract with what could be a, a company that might fail if it didn't get another large contract. Exactly. Um, so, so I'm really excited about the journey as well as the, as the when it will be built. Mm. The journey sounds a little bit like we had in one of the previous episodes uh, company building the sustainable city in Chile. 100,000 million was the name of the company. And their first earth city will be built in northern Chile. And they are, they are now in the process of getting the paperwork right and aiming to start building next year, just in a completely remote area, somewhere, a town for 20,000 people, and aiming to then replicate this to, the, to other countries. Again, with, with hyperlocal supply. Exactly, exactly, yeah. and hyperlocal power, power sources. So everything would be kind of it would be fully sustainable on its own. There's a, there's a really cool company um, based in based in Leeds. Uh, we got to know them because we started to provide um, their their, um, their housing developments with um, uh, fibre, and the reason that the conversation started in the first place was uh, I was contacted by the founders because they're, they're making these, these amazing modular passive homes. Uh, and it turns out that the cladding on the outside of these was provided by an Estonian company and they just wanted better contact with this, this company. Um, but what they do is they've taken the modular housing concepts of the nth degree and they build a factory on site that builds the modular panels. And by the time these panels go through to the end of the process, there are a few little offcuts that are left from, from the whole process. And obviously, then, then the, the, these things are being assembled literally a, a number of, you know, 100 meters away. But they then take all of these offcuts, they take them back to the beginning of the process, and they re-glue them, they re-laminate them, and those become part of the raw materials again. So by, by the time they get to the end of, build, of building all of these, these developments, they've just got a few little offcuts of wood left. It's absolutely amazing. Oh, absolutely. We should at least connect these guys. Exactly. <laughs> the power of podcasting. <laughs> the, they should do. Yeah. The, uh, cool. A uh, lot of interesting projects on your hands. Yes, yes. I have, I have, um, I have a tech startup as well. Which, oh, uh, really? <laughs> It was my um, it was my lockdown project, mm. and it's a, it's a supply chain integrity um, tracking solution. I, I built it uh, to address some of the challenges with, for example, the the, the recycle plastic recycling deposit return scheme. Uh, so this is a this is a, an immutable token platform. So think of it a bit like a, an NFT for recycling. Uh, it's a it's a very, my background cyber, it's a very hardened platform. 
but we wanted to create um, a Robin Hood model for our pricing. So if we're enabling something which is more good in the green economy, we are going to have a, a very, very philanthropic price tier to allow the system to be used. Mm -hmm. If it's being used for military inventory or for tracking you know, other kinds of manufacturing, they'll pay the normal price. Uh, but the idea is we wanted to make sure, for example, that, that the deposit return schemes are enabling the right behavior. So if the government taxes uh, maybe 10 to 20 pence on a single-use plastic bottle of water, uh, when these go into the reverse vending machine, uh, you've got to be sure that this has only been redeemed once. Um, otherwise, you end up with the same waste plastic being intercepted and pushed through the system time after time. So, yeah, I've built a little system that uh, that does that. So, if there's anyone out there that's uh, in the in the top, in the green economy mm. that needs to track somehow their inventory or or to be sure of where it's been supplied from. Then uh, it's called trusty.uk, trusty with an I, dot mm. UK. We will add a link to the show notes also for anyone to go and click and uh, check it out. Cool. Good. Uh, the sun is shining, it's spring outside. We will uh, go with Adam to the, all the next events of the Startup Day. Thank you all for listening. Yep. Thank you, Thomas. Hey, what's happening out there, everybody? This is Lawrence Ross, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about my podcast, The Lawrence Ross Show. Egomaniac. It's a two-hour weekly exploration into my mind. I also do sketches, celebrity impersonations. You're out of order! And I also do song parodies. Not too shabby for a blind guy. Not only are you visually impaired, but you are geographically impaired. New episodes are released every Friday. Check it out on your favorite podcasting platform or listen to it here on Society 13 on Electrocast. Hi, this is Megan Kane. And this is Jason Zook. And we're the hosts of Psychic Visions Podcast. Have you ever experienced deja vu or wonder what life after death is like? Or maybe you walked into an old building and got goosebumps or chills down your spine. Chances are you're having spiritual experiences without even realizing it. Our show will cover a variety of topics from astral projection to UFOs, manifestation, to the power of positive thinking and even healing energy. If this resonates with you, then this is your sign from the universe to check out our show. Find us where all podcasts are available. Psychic Visions, more than meets the eye. Electric Acid.